I'm so excited to be sharing the stage today. Uh, first with Sarah. Uh, she is a Fredericton, New Brunswick native, and she is a strong advocate. Oh yeah, Fredericton, yeah, you're in the house. Yeah, I hear you. Uh, she is a strong advocate for bilingualism and accessibility and has been a member of the Prime Minister's Youth Council. All right. Our second panelist is Donovan. Donovan is from a very small place in Newfoundland. So small <laughs> that there is, in fact, no road to it. No. Just a ferry. Yep. <laughs> uh, Donovan was the youngest person in Newfoundland to be elected to municipal office. And since then, he's been making incredible change, uh, particularly for queer rights, and is also a member of the Prime Minister's Council. And lastly, I, I have to admit, this is an all East Coast panel. There's a lot of cool stuff happening there. We've got Lacey, who is from Charlottetown PEI. And nice, nice, I hear it. Uh, she is an incredible advocate for young women in terms of their empowerment and is the founder of 24 Strong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, uh, so just a couple of housekeeping things before we get into our panel. Uh, this will be on Facebook Live, so if you've got friends or family who you think would be interested in the panel, uh, just post the link and they'll be able to follow along. Uh, and the second is that we do want to make sure that your questions uh, for these incredible young people are heard. So we'll be using the same tool uh, as yesterday where you can just use the poll EB and put in your, uh, your questions for any of our panelists. You can use a colon uh, and their first initial to demonstrate who it's for, or it can be for everyone. And we'll be sure to get those questions answered throughout the course of the panel. But first, I've kind of given the, the sentence version of who's, who's here on stage, but realistically, advocacy is so much more than that. And advocacy always starts with a story. Uh, and I wanna give all of our panelists a chance to tell that story before we get into questions. Uh, so I'd like to start with Sarah. All right, uh, how's everyone doing today? Um, just like Emily said, uh, my name is Sarah Abdesami. I'm a second year studying at Dalhousie University. I know there's some people from Dal here. Where are they? Hi! Um, yeah, it's so great to be here. Thank you so much for Jack.org for inviting me here and for me to be able to share my experience with advocacy work. It's just an honor. Um, so for me, the way that I started kind of working on the causes that mattered to me was once I moved to New Brunswick. So I used to live in Quebec for a while and then I had to move to New Brunswick because my dad had gotten a new job. And so I only spoke French once I got to a new province and it was really hard for me to kind of get accustomed to the new culture and also get to be able to learn a new language. It was really hard for me. But I I thought I was the only one going through that, you know? I thought I was the only one who didn't speak English and was struggling with the language. But once I got to meet the other people that went to my high school, which was a French high school, um, it was great to see that others also were feeling the same way. And so that's how I started to kind of go into that work and kind of promote bilingualism and make sure that the events that we had we're in both official languages to make sure that we had an inclusive space. So that's why I, I started a radio show where I would be able to bring people and um, let them speak and let them share their stories about how they were able to either learn French or learn English, depending on which one was their um, language of choice. So that's why I started doing this advocacy work. And I'm really excited to be here and kind of talk more about my experience. And I'm sure the other panelists also have amazing uh, stories to share. So thank you for... Uh, for having me. Great. Yeah. Next, let's hear from Donovan. Fun fact about me, between uh, Alessia, Cara, and I, there's one Grammy. Isn't that great? <laughs> <laughs> been waiting for that joke since I saw that video. Um, so in 2012, 2012, I found myself at the United Nations, and I was a part of a delegation of a group of young people all under the age of 25. And our job was to try to make sure the youth voice was integrated into the outcome document of this UN event. And we had the opportunity to present to these world leaders at the UN. And we flatlined. No one was listening. We spoke the same day that then Secretary of State Hillary Clinton spoke. 
So you can imagine when a group of young people are up on the stage, maybe that's not who they want to listen to. So when it was my turn to get up on stage, I thought, what can I possibly say to a group of UN delegates to get them to listen to young people? So I pointed out into that audience of UN delegates and I said, you don't know who's in charge. And they all kind of looked up like, I'm pretty sure we do. <laughs> <laughs> it's not you. <laughs> <laughs> I knew I had their attention. I pointed back out again and I said, you don't know who's in charge. And I said that the most important voice, the one that's missing from this discussion, is the voice of young people. Because leadership, as we all know, is about the next generation, not the next election. And of course, it's young people who will inherit the social, financial, and ecological debt of the decision makers of today. So a lot of the work I've done has been trying to influence government actors at the municipal, provincial, federal, and international level. So I want to end with that note, just to say that when we are doing our advocacy, part of my work has always been trying to take the voices of the small town I'm in and bring them to as many levels where decisions are being made as possible. And last but not least, let's hear Lacey's story. Hi guys, uh, my name is Lacey. I am 18 years old and I'm from Charlottetown, PEI. Um, my company, 24 Strong, is an empowerment program and a movement across Canada that empowers teenage girls to be the best versions of themselves that they can be. So we offer different programs and workshops. We have fitness classes and we also have an e-magazine that's put together by girls from all across Canada where we share inspiring stories that will hopefully motivate girls to take action. Um, so I started this actually, 24 Strong is my second company, so it was inspired by my first company that I opened when I was 16. I opened a dance school in PEI called 24 Dance, and this inspired the creation of 24 Strong because there was a group of girls that I taught almost every day, so we became really close, and at the end of our classes, we would sit in a circle just to cool down and stretch a bit, and we started just talking. First, it was just talking about whatever, like random things, but over the few weeks we got closer together, they started opening up about things like body image and social media and how it was affecting them, things at school, things that were happening at home, and I felt really honored that they felt safe enough to share these things with me in our space. So these five minute conversations kind of sparked the creation of something that I wanted to create even on a bigger level. So that's where the inspiration for 24 Strong came from, but I never imagined it would grow into what it has become today. So whenever I get back to PEI, I have five new programs starting for girls ages nine up to 18. And yeah, I'm just super excited to be here to meet all of you guys, and I've been really inspired so far. This is my first Jack Summit, so I'm loving it. But yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so thank you all for sharing your stories, and I think uh, that's what this weekend is really about. Uh, it's getting to know people, it's about hearing their stories, and I think one of the most special aspects of the summit for me is that I feel like I'm with my people. I feel like I'm surrounded by people who understand me, who care about the things that I care about, and yeah, who are passionate about making change. But sometimes it can be hard after we leave summit, after we leave kind of big groups like this and really to go back to our communities and try to recreate those, those same spaces where you feel like you're around people who care about the same things that you care about. Uh, and so my qu question, starting with Sarah, is how do you create a community of people who care about the same things that you care about? Um, so uh, what I want to say first is that it takes patience, you know, it doesn't happen uh, from one day to another. You know, you get this idea and you have this passion and you have this cause that you really want to work on, but you can't just go in your community and start right away. I think the key point for that is doing research and meeting with people directly, you know, from, uh, from the outside world. It can be really hard to see if someone's passionate about a certain cause from the outside if you haven't had a chance to have this conversation with them. So I think just by going out there and maybe organizing events or even be part of these events like this, this is a good way for you to kind of see and meet new people, have this network of people that are from the same regions as you because you're all li living the same reality. For me, when I went to New Brunswick, since it was a new 
region, it was a new province, I didn't, I didn't realize that many people felt the same way that I did until I started speaking about it. So you have to make that first step. You have to go out there, you have to start having those conversations because you have to make sure that at least you're gonna be able to help someone else who doesn't maybe have the chance to speak up or have the platform to be able to talk about a certain cause that matters to them. So obviously it takes patience, it takes going out there, putting yourself out there, being vulnerable sometimes as well, sharing your stories. Um, I think that, that helps a lot when it comes to building that community because obviously you're not the only one going through that and this is the evidence for that. You know, you're all very passionate about mental health and it's so great to see so many people that are so determined um, and you get to meet them all and then go back to your communities and continue that work. So I think that's a, a good way to start. Totally. Yeah, and I know for Donovan, one of your first kind of um, parts in your advocacy journey was essentially getting your entire town to rally around a single cause. And I think that's something that's really admirable because it cu cuts across lots of different groups, you know, across different generations, genders, people with different political opinions. How did you bring your community together? So the, the cause she's referring to was me. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, is anyone here familiar with Students on Ice? The uh, yeah, expedition yeah. program, yeah, great. So uh, a number of years ago, I um, had gotten the opportunity to go on an expedition with Students on Ice, and they take young people to the Arctic and the Antarctic. So I found out that I had been chosen for these expeditions, but they cost $26,000. And from my very small uh, rural hometown, um, well over half the community would be below the low income cutoff. So that number might as well be a billion dollars. It seems so out of reach. So when I got that email, uh, my mother, who was at the time working as a part-time cashier, um, said, well, fundraise it. And I said, what? <laughs> Who's going to fundraise? <laughs> Are you going to do it? <laughs> so this story really ends up going to hot dogs. Mm -hmm. Hot dogs. So this was the idea. Here's what we're going to do. Donovan, we're going to go to the local pub down the street, and we're going to see if you can set up a hot dog stand outside the club from midnight till 5 AM and sell hot dogs to drunk people coming in and out of the bar. <laughs> thought, that's a great idea, Mom. How come I didn't think of that? <laughs> so I did it. And I would be outside this pub in this small town, and people would come up to me, and they'd go, oh, my God, you're that young feller who's going to the Arctic. Is that you? For those of you who are from rural or remote Canada, you know that in small towns, an individual achievement can be viewed as a community achievement. So the way that I began my advocacy was by bringing a community together to say that in a town where young people always have the deck stacked against them, in a town where young people are often not exposed to world-class opportunities to make a difference, I finally have a shot. And by telling that why and the purpose of, of the opportunity I had, the whole community was able to rally around it. So the piece of advice to take away from that is to be able to focus in on the narrative, the why, the story, and that can bring a whole community together. And also, one key point which we talked about is to not be afraid of fundraising. Often, if you can tell a story that connects with people, they want to be a part of it. They want to give their time and their money to that cause to make it happen. Thank you so much. Yeah. And Donovan is, is very, um, yeah, he's quite humble actually because he, raised an incredible amount of money just from selling hot dogs to drunk people. It was over 20 grand, am I right? Yeah, so that's pretty incredible, yeah. Yeah. A lot of tips. Yeah. A lot of tips. <laughs> so another way that we're building community um, more and more these days is actually through online communities. And social media can be such a place of empowerment and place where you find your people even if they're not in the same place as you. But it can also be a bit of a double-edged sword. It can be a place where you feel actually quite far away from people, where you can feel isolated, um, where you can even experience 
bullying and, and isolation in that way. Uh, and so one of the things that really strikes me about Lacey's story is that she's used social media as a platform from the start for 24 Strong and in a really, really empowering and positive way. So can you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, sure. Um, so with my personal experiences through social media, when I say social media, I'm just mainly referring to Instagram. Um, I struggled a lot with my confidence and just like fitting in, especially in junior high, first year of high school. So I turned to Instagram to try and like fit in. So I was just trying to be like all of the Instagram models and all these girls I was seeing. So I was posting things that were nothing like myself. Um, but I thought that that was gonna make me feel better because I was getting more followers and more people were liking my stuff, but it actually just made me feel worse about myself because I knew that I was being inauthentic. So I had a really tough time with social media for a while, um, but whenever I, after I got therapy and help with it, because my social media um, addiction, I guess, is what really started my struggle with my mental health. So whenever I got the proper help, the help that I needed, um, I decided to use my platform as a way to connect with other people and use it as a way to inspire other people to be more authentic online because I wasn't seeing that at all. I was only seeing all of the edited pictures and captions that mean nothing um, and I wanted to be inspired online so I decided to be that inspiration instead. So I started to post more authentically. I started reaching out to people that inspired me just like through sending them DMs, asking them if we could meet for a coffee or like traveling. If I was in their city, I'd meet up with them. Um, and then through doing that, I saw that people really do want to help. Um, and yeah, a lot of, there's like a weird thing about like sliding into DMs, like it just, <laughs> I don't know, like I know what that means, but um, I, do, <laughs> I do it all the time. Um, and I've met some incredible people from doing that. A lot of my closest friends are people that I don't actually get to see a lot in person, but I can connect with them online, always reach out to them for help. And I think that that's something that we all need to uh, take more advantage of because you can literally connect to anyone online um, and maybe it is a little bit scary to send the message the first time but the worst that's going to happen is they don't answer it or maybe they don't see it because they're getting a lot of messages but it's worth a try because I've really had some incredible experiences come from doing that so because of all of that I started asking these people that I was reaching out to if they'd feel comfortable sharing how they use Instagram in an authentic way. So I turned to my 24 Strong account, started sharing stories of inspiring women and girls through the platform so that young girls are seeing only inspiring things. They're seeing body positivity, they're seeing people taking action on what they believe in, and that's what they're seeing in their feeds instead of just fake things because that's not helping anyone in the end. So. That's really what I do now, and I try to be as authentic as I can on my Instagram. Um, and yeah, it's made me feel a lot better, and I hope that I can make other people feel better also by doing that. Yeah. And I think that's, it's such a key message, right, is just that empathy, right? The ability to connect with people, even if it's hard at first to kind of craft exactly what your message is, to talk to people and find out yeah, what are they thinking about and what's important to them and to engage in it in a really authentic way. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna uh, just add up on the screen here our poll. Uh, and if you've had any burning questions that have been on your mind as you've been hearing these incredible stories, feel free to pop them up there and we'll take a look in a couple of minutes and see kind of what you wanna hear from these incredible young leaders. Um, but for right now, I actually want to focus on how you can extend your community of the people who are super passionate uh, about what you do and who really care about the same things that you care about uh, to people in power. So, for instance, you know, I'm actually, as far as youth go, fairly old, but I still get carted at the liquor store all the time. And when I go into a meeting, I feel like I don't belong. I feel like when I go in there, no one's gonna take me seriously. And even if I have a really great idea, it's not gonna come across. And I have a question for pretty much everyone on this panel. How do you go into a meeting with people who hold power, whether it's through money, grant applications, whether it's through policy or action on campus, how do you go in and make sure that your message is heard? Yeah, and anyone can start. Um, for me, I believe it's all in confidence. Um, for me, whenever I go into meetings with older people or 
more experienced people, I find that the only way that I'm going to get through it is if I'm confident in what I'm doing and the reason that I'm there. Um, so I guess by just educating yourself as much as you can, if you're going in to pitch something, like you, you would know what you're pitching anyway, it's your thing. So you just have to be confident and believe in that. And I mean, you're not always going to get yeses or approval. Um, I know this a lot from growing up, like I'm a performer, so I've been to tons of auditions and it kind of goes along with that, that sometimes it's just not the right fit also. Um, but as long as you're confident, then that's the best you can do. Um, yeah, I guess that's really all, just be confident. I could go. Um, for me, I actually started being involved with adults and older people when I was still in high school. Um, I was in this board of committees where I worked with the district, so I was the only high school student in front of people that were parents and all that that were working on the district and, you know, deciding whether we, or not we had to close schools and things like that. Um, so I guess that was like my first experience coming into the adult world and kind of learning from that has been an incredible experience. So for me in the beginning, I didn't talk too much. I was just there and kind of listening in, learning from it and kind of get an idea of what it was to work with older people, I guess, with adults. Um, but then once I got the confidence, like Lacey's saying, I was way more comfortable talking and making sure that my opinion was heard. Um, you know, being part of the Prime Minister's Youth Council, we meet with so many ministers and we meet with the Prime Minister and many experts that have been working on different issues for many, many years and we're young people and we've probably started our, our advocacy work for a couple of years now. So it can be intimidating. But you know, when you get that sense of, you know what? I have something to say, and I'm going to say it, and I'm going to fight hard for this. Once you put that mindset into your mind, just saying that what you have to say actually matters, I think you can do incredible things, no matter who you're talking to. It could be someone your age or someone older. So the first person I ever voted for was myself. <laughs> After I had that fundraising blitz, I was very connected to the community. When I returned from those expeditions, I thought, how could I ever repay this community? If I went door to door for the rest of my life, I'll never be able to pay them back. And someone in my hometown said, most people, as soon as they graduate high school, the first thing they do is get out of this town. The thing you can give back is your time and your energy. So I thought, what better way to do that than to run for office? <laughs> <laughs> so I decided to run for the municipal council, and I was 19. So I was lucky to get elected. And when I was elected, the next youngest person was 58. <laughs> so 1958. And as you can think, there aren't a lot of people in rural municipal politics in Newfoundland that look like me, right? They're not this stylish. So <laughs> they're not. They don't have this style. So one of the things I wanted to get done, I knew I was the first uh, young person really ever on the council, and I was the first queer person ever on the council. I said, there's a few agenda items I need to tick. And at the end of my term, when I had solidified myself as someone who was credible, through taking on tough challenges, through being um, as resilient as I could in an environment where I was a kid, where some of the people on the council were older than my parents. One person was older than my grandparents. And here I am, their colleague on a municipal council. One of the things I wanted to do was start a Pride Week in the town which for many of you probably sounds like a given. Pride week, whoop de doo And it could, and it, you know, it barely got done. So I brought forth a proclamation to have a pride week in the town and I talked to why I thought it would be important. I mean, you have to remember, till that point, the pride parade in the community was when I would go check my mail at the post office. <laughs> you know, that was, that was the extent. So, <laughs> We were, I'm here. We were lucky enough to get a pride flag raised at the municipal building. And this was the first time a pride flag had ever been at a public building in the town. And I thought, wow, this is a great box to check. And then online, on Facebook, people who are part of a community which I think I owe everything to started saying, that does not belong here. That has no place in this town. I don't like that young people in this community can see a symbol of queer identity. So here I found myself in this place where a town that I loved, that had given me every opportunity I had so far, I felt was turning their back on me. 
they were not only saying I don't want a pride flag, it was in a way um, challenging my very identity. And when you're working in intergenerational context, the stuff that's a given to us is not always going to be a given to the next generation. So what it took was being able to step back, have that conversation that was mentioned during the keynote about calling in and calling out, and empathizing with people. It was sitting at kitchen tables. It was seeing people at the grocery store and talking to them about it and saying, here's what that flag can mean to people in this town. Because as many Facebook posts as I saw about people saying that doesn't belong here, I saw as many of people driving by the municipal building just to take a picture of it because they couldn't believe it was in the town. So what I would say is, and when you're in the intergenerational context, one of the most important things to be able to do is to be able to empathize with people and do the nitty gritty work of sitting down with them face to face and having a conversation with them about the work you're doing and why you're doing it and the impact it can have. And to my experience, more often than not, when people are presented with reasonable information and evidence and a personal story, they will agree with you in the end. Yeah, and I just have so much admiration for, for that, Donovan, because I think it could have been so easy just to, to leave, say, you know, I don't need this, I'm getting out of here. But I think for you, the aspect of, of taking the personal and combining it with the political and that kind of uh, really traditional, you know, black feminist tradition of the personal being the political uh, and, and not giving up, not trying to separate those things uh, and working through it in a way that, that actually gets people on side when they realize that yeah, this personal thing is something that affects everyone. It's not just you. Yeah. So I'm looking up here, I'm kind of craning my neck, so I am gonna actually just stand to make sure that I can see exactly what you guys are asking. Uh, I really like this second question, so I'm gonna read it aloud and, and you guys can stew on it. Uh, so how can we include groups with different social identities but avoid tokenism? Uh, so making sure that we're including people but not doing it because we want to have, you know, a face that's not white or an, an identity that's not straight. Yeah, it's a hard one. Yeah, it is a hard one. Um, I can speak about some experience I've, I've had um, personally with, uh, you know, advocacy work and all that, especially when you have certain events, you obviously want to have as much representation as possible, and that can be hard sometimes, but I feel like it goes on its way naturally. Like, you get representation from people from all over the country here, for example, or you get people from different backgrounds, from different identities, and we're all basically the same. We're all here to make a difference. We're all here to make, to work on a cause that we all have in common. Um, so, for example, on campus, I've noticed that, uh, at, at Dalhousie University, I've noticed that the accessibility is not a cause that is important to many people. I guess I haven't heard, heard a lot of conversation about accessibility and many buildings and many events don't really mention on their promoting marketing or even posters that, you know, if you have an accessibility need, let us know, we'll accommodate you. I've, it's very rare when you get to see that, but just making sure that you have it on a poster, you will be able to have that kind of representation. You will be able to include people with disabilities or people of different backgrounds into your own events, into your own community, and into your own cause without necessarily having that tokenism into it. You know, it's just something that's natural, just being able to include those people. The same goes for bilingualism. Just the fact that you mentioned that this event will be bilingual and that you'll be able to speak on the language of your choice, whether it's French or English. Um, just that, it brings so much confidence to many people who probably are more comfortable talking in French to come to that event and share their own ideas because they also represent a different identity, they represent a different background. So just having those little things, just showing that you want to include them without having to say, you know, oh, we want people from, you know, we want people that have uh, disabilities to come to this event because this will be an event talking about accessibility. No, you just mentioned that, you know, if you have a certain accommodation, we'll be here to help you. So I think just making sure that you include uh, those things um, on posters, even on social media, it'll make a big change. Yeah, I guess I would say there have been times when I have been the token queer person, the token young person, um, the token Newfoundlander um, <laughs> at events. But sometimes the 
being the token can actually lead to full integration. So while at first you may be aware of your status as a token, I have been able to sometimes wiggle my way into being fully integrated into that original group. One way I would say to do it is just get it in black and white. Find out what is the process of this young person being involved. What are the tangible abilities I have? So for example, if a um, organization, which is largely made up of adults, um, decides we're going to have uh, a youth advisory panel, find out, do we have a vote at board meetings? I want to vote. I don't want to be able to give you a recommendation. I would like a vote at the meeting, a real vote, so that when you decide what are we going to do for this program, that young people can actually submit their ballot, if you will, at these meetings. That's one way. Another one is find out what is the pipeline. So if I have a youth advisory role in some capacity, who does it go to next? So when I give you this proposal for something I want you to do, who's the next person it goes to? And who's the next person after that? And make sure that pipeline is clear, right? So when it comes to tokenism, a way to avert it is just to find out what are the processes that are taking place here and how can you um, make them more firm so that your voice actually is going to the top tier. And once it gets there, does it actually count for something in the form of a vote, in the form of an outcome document? And if it does, then you have transcended being a token then, and you have actually made a tangible impact. Yeah, and such an important question, but such articulate answers. And I think, too, one thing that you've mentioned to me, Sarah, is that sometimes people don't realize that uh, you know, an advocacy issue applies to them. So for instance, with accessibility, it's, it's not just about having wheelchair accessibility, even though that's really important and we do a really terrible job of it. Accessibility encompasses so much more than that. And by kind of sharing that with communities and making it clear in your advertising, yeah, you can kind of hit that home. I'm gonna take one more from up here and I'm gonna kind of combine one. So I'm seeing a lot in terms of policy and government uh, and also, like, what's, what's next in terms of policy and government? Like, what can we as young people kind of be championing? Um, so, yeah, so maybe I can ask each of you, what do you think is the most important policy change um, that we can enact in, say, the next 10 years? Um, and, and how would you go about that if you were sitting in the audience? That's a hard question, too. <laughs> Yeah, no, it is a good question, to be honest. To be able to um, be involved in politics and policy making and all that, it's very important because you see a big impact through government. Um, talking about that, uh, us, uh, part of the Prime Minister's Youth Council, we're currently working on a youth policy. So that's a very big um, change that we're going to be able, able to put into government, to be able to have our voice more heard, to be able to have issues that matter to us put into the House of Commons and, you know, bring that conversations, uh, those conversations to ministers and to the Prime Minister himself. I think it's very great to have that opportunity and there will be many chances all over the country to attend different dialogues when it comes to that youth policy because it's time to kind of get ideas right now. We're just putting it together. It's not something that uh, we've been doing for a long time. We actually just started. So in your communities, try to find a member of the Prime Minister Youth Council that's whether in Manitoba or in Toronto or anything like that, we're all over the country and we'll be doing dialogues and that's how we're going to be able to make changes into the government itself. Um, for me, one thing that's really important is education. And education doesn't just mean schooling. And for me, I have a very unique experience when it comes to my education because I actually dropped out of high school. I dropped out in grade 11 um, because I wanted to learn, well, I opened my business in grade 11, so I wanted to learn more about business and I wanted to travel. And there were so many things I wanted to learn that I felt that I was missing out on when I was in school. It's just not the right environment for me to learn. Um, so one thing that I'm trying to do in Prince Edward Island is bring more emphasis to courses that are already offered in the school, but things like co-op and independent study that already give students the opportunity to learn the things they want to learn, but still get credit for school. Because for me, I got a lot of backlash, obviously, at first, whenever people would find out that I dropped out of high school. They don't trust me necessarily with the things that I'm doing. Um, but for me, it's really important that people recognize that learning exists. Like, this is a perfect env environment. Like, we're learning so much this weekend. And learning exists in so many other ways outside of the classroom. So for me, I'm trying to incorporate that more into 
the schools in PEI, um, which, and it's kind of cool, they actually started bringing me into schools now to talk to the students about my learning outside of the classroom, which I think is really awesome and a cool perspective for them to hear, which I wasn't really expecting them to bring me in to do, but yeah, it's cool. Yeah, just really quickly, I'll just localize this to the mental health conversation. Mm -hmm. So what we know right now about mental health policy is that we have the evidence, okay? The studies are there, the science is there, the knowledge base is already there. We have so much research on the need for increased mental health funding, on destigmatization, and the many other themes that I'm sure you've talked about since this conference began. So the knowledge base is there. And on the financial side, that's there too. We have all the money and resources we need in Canada to enact the programs, services, and policies that are recommended in the knowledge base. So, when you're trying to tackle a policy problem and you have the knowledge base and you have the financial resources, but yet nothing has changed. So what is the, what's the issue? Political will. When you find yourself as an advocate and you go, okay, do we need to do research? Yes or no? And if it's yes, then you do the research. If it's no, it's already there. The next question, do we have the resources? If it's no, then you find them. If it's yes, it's already there. So the resources are there, the knowledge is there, then that's the gap, political will. So that, I think, is what the big policy tackle with mental health. We have the knowledge, we have the money, we need to get people with the power to enact and, act and activate those resources to do it, right? I said at the Jack Summit last year or the year before, we have to make sure that politicians know if mental health is not a priority, you will not get our vote. So you have to make mental health a voting issue and make sure that they will match resources with knowledge. All incredible points, yeah. I feel like just in like probably five years, given your track record, we're gonna have one of these people as prime minister. They're all so incredible and have such great ideas. Um, yeah, I wanna shift a little bit, um, just thinking we're coming to the end of the summit, and I know that as a, as a past summit attendee, uh, I come here, I hear about what everyone's doing, I feel so inspired, I attend the workshops, I gain all these skills, and I'm just, yeah, I'm so excited to go back to my community and enact these things. Uh, but at the same time, I recognize that one of the main reasons I'm involved in, in mental health advocacy is because I myself have struggled with mental health, and that struggle is far from over. And I'm sure there is a lot of people in the room who feel the same way. So it's always hard when we're, we're working on an issue that's so close to home for us, and it's so important, but we also have to kind of be mindful and take care of ourselves when we're pushing towards these changes. Uh, and so yeah, this is a balance that, that I'm still working on. How do I balance the things that I really care about and bring me so much meaning and joy, but that also take up a lot of time and energy and are very, very personal to me? Uh, and so my question for each of you is, how have you found your balance? How has, how has it been uh, to create a balance in your life, in your advocacy work, and how have you been able to kind of take care of yourself and sometimes recenter what advocacy looks like? Um, yeah, start with Lacey. Sure. Um, I would say it's a bit of trial and error. I'm definitely still trying to find that balance. Um, for me, it's looked like I'm a very ambitious person, so I always want to say yes to every opportunity. I always want my name to be involved in everything, um, which isn't a bad thing, but I think there's a point where you maybe you're taking on too many things, and I definitely reached that point. Um, last summer, I was actually in the hospital because I was completely burnt out. Um, I was just doing way too many things, and I was so passionate about all of them that it took a lot of mental energy and physical energy from me. Um, and what that looked like was that all of these projects that I was a part of were amazing opportunities, but because I was spreading myself too thin, I wasn't really making any progress or much of an impact in any of the things that I was a part of. Um, and because I'm running 24 strong and I was telling all of these young girls how to practice self-care and take care of themselves, I realized that I wasn't doing any of the things that I was telling them to do. And that felt really 
um, inauthentic to me because I felt like they're going to notice that. They're going to know if I'm not doing the things I'm telling them to practice. So I really, really had to take a step back once I was completely like unable to do anything. Um, and I had a few weeks of a break where I just worked with my therapist. We looked at all of the things that I was taking on currently, and we kind of reevaluated what things do I not have to be doing right now? Like, what's the most important thing for me to work on right now? And that was actually none of the projects. It was taking care of myself. So I had to actually declined some of the things I was working on and I put 24 Strong on hold for a bit because I knew that I was only gonna come back stronger um, and there was no point in me trying to push forward when I was feeling the way that I felt. So it really takes a lot of reflecting. For me, that looks like writing. I write a lot, um, like just in a journal about what's going on and I think because all of us are living such busy lives, like with advocacy, school, work, whatever, um, it's, it's kind of easy to get lost in the rush. Like I feel like, a lot of people in our generation are rushing for something. Um, there's like the whole like hustle, hustle, hustle sort of mindset that I've been hearing. And I think that that can be a bit dangerous. It, we definitely need to slow down a bit. There's no rush. Um, and yeah, so reevaluating, reflecting, I think is the best way to stay balanced. But I am still working on that, I'll be honest. <laughs> Yeah, um, I, disclaimer, I have crashed and burned. <laughs> My goodness, have I crashed and burned. I'm doing it right now, no. I, um, it was this morning. So, not really, he's no, joking. Really. It was wonderful this morning. <laughs> <laughs> so here's what I would say. Um, when it comes to self-care or, or, or whatever kind of terminology you want to put on it, I'll, I'll give you one kind of castle in the sky tip and one more practical one. And we'll start with the more practical one. I don't know if you've heard of this concept called micro progress. Have you ever heard of this? So this is something I've st I started practicing because I had, a, I had burnout really, really bad. And if I got an email, I couldn't respond to it because I thought I cannot put one more thing on my plate. I cannot even do an email. So micro progress is the idea of when you're setting your goals to have micro steps that you can check off progress for. So my goal is not to write a short story. My goal is to open a Word doc. And my second goal is to put a title on the Word doc. And my third goal is to write the first paragraph. And oftentimes, when you get started on something, you're going to go through with it. So, but getting started is a lot harder to do when the goal is make sure mental health is in Canada's national youth policy. <laughs> goal one should be find the number of the first person I want to call. Right? So that would be practical tip one, is give yourself mo micro progress and a micro checklist of accomplishments. The, the uh, castle in the sky one. Years ago, because I'm also on the periphery of young now, even though I know I look so good for my age. <laughs> I know, we look great. <laughs> we we really great. do. <laughs> I was being interviewed for a scholarship, and it was a really big one. And Sarah has, has won that scholarship. And it was six figures. It's very big. And... Um, the last question they asked me was, if you could have lunch with one person, dead or alive, who would it be? And I thought, well, I'm competing against the top students in the country. I've got to say Mandela or Shakespeare. I have to come up with a, you know. And I started to cry in the middle of the interview. I had a breakdown. They thought, time to answer. <laughs> and I said, if I could have lunch with one person, dead or alive, it would be my grandmother, who passed away when I was 14. And she was a mother of 14 kids who raised them in poverty on a little island in Newfoundland. And she taught me everything I know about storytelling and about making a difference. So what I would say when it comes to self-care is to always be able to bring yourself back to that focus, to that grounding of who you are and what you believe in. And to know that the best advocates and the people that I looked up to the most aren't a Mandela <laughs> or a Shakespeare. It's my grandmother and my mother and people who have an ordinary courage in their everyday lives. As an advocate, when people say, Donovan, how do you possibly have the stamina to keep doing this over and over again? And I say, I have never had a day as an advocate which has been harder than a single day in my grandmother's life. I've never had a day as an advocate which was harder than any of the people I grew up with on my street who were generations into poverty and abuse. Never have I had a harder day as an advocate. And if you can remember that, that the people you're advocating for are often having a much harder day than you are, 
and remember where you come from and what you believe in, self-care becomes so much easier. And you combine that with those little micro progress and micro goals, and it's a lot easier to stay on your feet for a long time. <laughs> well, Lacey and Donovan kind of explained it pretty well. Um, but for me personally, um, I think just like Donovan says, I, it's my family, you know, the people that I'm surrounded with, the people that support me, my friends, my family, it could be anybody. I think those are the people that kind of push me to go further and they kind of show me that, you know, there's some days that can be hard and there's other days where you have, you know, the best of your life. But, you know, it's just a balance of both, you know, you just have to think about that hard day and just have to think about, you know, the next day is gonna be better, you know, tomorrow's a new day, I'm gonna wake up, I'm gonna do my work and everything that I have to do and if I can't do it, it's okay. You know, if you have to say no to something, don't feel like you're weak, don't feel like you had to do it and you committed to it, just say no, it's all good. Actually, you'll do yourself a favor, but you're also gonna be doing the other person's a favor because, you know, you're probably gonna be not on your best, um, you're probably gonna do not your best work once you get into that commitment. So I guess sometimes you just have to say no and it's okay. Yeah, and thank you so much for that. Thank you all, I think these are amazing tips. And I think one thing that I've really taken away from this conference is, is sometimes the, the most important advocacy work you can do if you're struggling is, is to take care of yourself. And that in of itself is an act of resistance to say, hey, I matter, the things I care about matter, and caring for myself also matters. Uh, and I think based on that, you have been able to build on that sense of self into just incredible, incredible actions and impacts. So thank you all for that. And let's thank our panel.